Thank you. This morning I'm going to speak to you on the subject, the golden altar of incense, or Jesus, our intercessor. I have a chart here. I hope you can see it. It is a facsimile of the Old Testament tabernacle in the wilderness. Israel marched through the wilderness 40 years. They carried this tent with them, and it was their house of worship. It was the house of God. And God met with them in the second room of that tabernacle. And as you approach the different articles of furniture, you are given Old Testament pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's stand together, please, and read together from your bulletin, Exodus 30, verses 1 and 6 through 10. We'll read together. I'll read the first verse. You respond with verse 6. Exodus 30, verse 1, and then 6 through 10. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shadow wood shalt thou make it. And Aaron shall burn incense every morning, sweet incense. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps of the evening, he shall burn incense upon it, and perpetual incense before the Lord throughout the generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereof, neither burnt off sacrifice nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereof. And Aaron shall make a tongue upon the horns of the twenty years of the blood of the sin offering of the tongue. Once in the year it shall be made of torment upon him throughout our generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. Thank you. Be seated, please. First, I would have you to consider this morning the altar itself. It was an altar of incense. Incense was placed upon it on the hot coals. It was four square and overlaid with gold. And if you open your bulletin, you will see a picture of the altar of incense. Every year, the high priest had to come in, or one of the priests, and place fire of coals upon that altar, and then on the coals would be placed incense, which sent a smoke and a sweet odor up through the air toward God. And God was pleased with that. And this is the way God laid it out. It had four horns upon the four corners of the altar. It had also a crown of gold. It was placed directly in front of the veil in the holy place. Then the burning coals were placed upon it. The sweet incense was placed on the coals morning and evening. And morning and evening, a column of white smoke ascended up to God. In Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 7, the blood of the sin offering was applied to the four horns of the altar of incense. And we read, And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle. It was the blood that gave value to the incense. And thus when we pray, it is the blood of redemption which we have been redeemed by which gives merit to our prayers. Without that, our prayers would have no merit. In chapter eight, uh, chapter 30 and verse 8, we read, When Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense, before the Lord throughout your generation. In other words, it was to be a continual burning, morning and evening. And it is a picture of the intercession of Christ. He prays for us morning and evening. We are 
before the Father in His prayers every day. And it's a remarkable thing that many Christians have never stopped to realize that Christ is praying for us. He is our intercessor. He makes intercession to the Father with prayer for us. We'll consider that in a few moments. Notice its position. It occupied a central position in the holy place, telling us that Christ has the central position of all. The incense is a symbol of prayer. And that's the subject. David prayed in Psalms 141, Lord, I, pray, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. David prayed. He was a man of prayer. And he said, let my prayer be set before thee as incense. No doubt he was thinking of the golden altar of incense in the tabernacle. And he wanted his prayer to be to God like that incense was to God. Now, Christ has two altars as a priest. Usually we only hear of one, but he has two altars. His priestly work of sacrifice on the cross was symbolized by the brazen altar. The brazen altar pictures the cross. Then his priestly work of intercession is symbolized by the golden altar of incense. So there are two altars, and he is the high priest of both. The high priest made a sacrifice for the people of Israel, and Jesus made a sacrifice of himself for us, his people. And so you have two altars, the brazen altar and the golden altar of incense, one picturing his work at the cross and one picturing his work in heaven as an intercessor. The brazen altar is the cross. It's behind him now. It's been fulfilled. But the golden altar speaks of his intercession as a priest, and it is before him. It is before him now. He is making intercession now for his people. Now the brazen altar, from which our high priest purchased our redemption, is a past event. He'll never be crucified again. No one can ever be crucified for you. Jesus died on the cross one time for all, forever. And he never adds to that or takes away from that. It was a one-time offering. And that's the reason why we do not believe in some of these religions that offer Christ up every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning they re-offer Christ up again. But the Bible says he offered himself once. For all, not over and over and over. You can't re-crucify over over and over our Lord. He made one offering for all time, forever, and sat down at the right hand of God. So the brazen altar is in the past. We read in Hebrews 1.3 about the work of the brazen altar, who being the brightness of His glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, the tabernacle never had a chair in it because the priest's work was never finished. He couldn't sit down. His work went on and on and on. But this man, after he had offered one offering, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Why did Jesus sit down at the right hand of God? Because on the cross, when he gave himself for our sins to be a sacrifice, he cried, it is finished. The work of redemption was completed on the cross. There's nothing to be added to it. Your prayers cannot be added to it. There is nothing that anyone can add to the finished work 
of Jesus Christ. It's all finished. It's all in the past. The work has already been done. He made an atonement for the sins of all His people. Now then we look at the golden altar of incense where He today is making intercession for us now. And we read in verse 25 of the book of Hebrews chapter 7. Wherefore, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him. See, He ever liveth to make intercession for them. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us. That's Jesus. Holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Jesus never had any sins, but he offered himself up for the sins of his people. So there are the two altars, the golden altar of incense and the brazen altar. Now both of those are brought together in one verse of Scripture. For example, Romans 8.34 brings the golden altar and the brazen altar both together in one. The cross and His intercession both brought together in one verse. Let me read it to you. Romans 8.34 Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. There you have it again. Who maketh intercession for us. You know, I had a lady one time got mad at me in the church. And as she went out the door, I was shaking hands with the people, and as she went out the door, she said, I'm not going to pray for you anymore. I said, that's okay, lady. I have a priest at the right hand of the Father and he's praying for me every day. I don't need your prayer anyway. You see, he prays for you and I every day. And if other people fail to pray for us, that's okay because he's praying for us. And as long as he's praying for us, we don't need to worry about anything. Now the coals of fire, and here you have Christ that died, that's the brazen altar, who also made an intercession, that's the golden order of intercession. Now going on, the coals of fire from the brazen altar were placed upon the golden altar. There's a connection between the two. There's a connection between the priest at the cross and the priest at intercession. He's the same priest of both, but they're connected together. In Leviticus 6 and verse 12, he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord. That's the brazen altar. And his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. According to Exodus 3.9, no sacrifice was to be offered upon the golden altar. Why is that? Because we can make no sacrifice. The sacrifice was made by Jesus on the cross. And you and I cannot make that sacrifice. Jesus alone made that sacrifice. And we are not to... We are not to add to the finished work of Christ. If we do, we defile the altar. That golden altar is also seen in heaven. If you go to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, there you will see this same golden altar of incense up in heaven because there is a true tabernacle in heaven as well as the one that was on the earth. One was a type or a picture of the other. And I read Romans 8, uh, Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. 
And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now let's leave the altar for a moment and consider the high priest of the altar. When the high priest went in to serve God, he was the people's intercessor. The priest prayed for the people. Jesus, our high priest, who has gone into the holy temple of God in heaven, he is our intercessor. He prays for us. The incense on the altar was offered by Aaron, the high priest. Jesus offers the incense of his prayers to the Father for you and I in the true tabernacle of heaven. I read in verse 7 of Exodus 30. And Aaron shall burn sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighted the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Aaron pictures Christ. As Aaron pictures the incense being offered on the golden altar of intercession, he pictures Christ interceding for us at the golden altar in heaven. So I read in Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, that is, made with hands, which are figures of the truth. The Old Testament tabernacle on earth was a figure or a type or a picture of the true tabernacle in heaven. But into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. You know, as often as we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What if we forget to confess our sins? What if we forget to pray? Well, God takes care of that. Our high priest is in perpetual prayer for us. He doesn't forget. You and I may forget to pray. We may forget to confess our sins, but he doesn't forget. He prays for us. You remember what he said to Peter? Peter said, Satan hath desired to have you, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Now he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before men. Before the cock grows twice, you will deny me thrice. Peter said, I would never do that, Lord. I would never deny you. And Jesus said, you will. You will. But I have prayed for you that thy faith fail not. You see, Jesus, the divine intercessor, had prayer ahead of Peter's fall. Before Peter fell, Jesus was ahead of it and prayed for it and took care of it. And when you forget to pray, He doesn't forget. He's ahead of it, and He prays for you. Now that doesn't mean you don't need to pray. If you don't pray, the Lord may take you to the woodshed. But remember this. Your intercessor is ahead of your fall. He's ahead of any problems you may have. He's ahead of everything. He knows what's going to happen. And he gets ahead of it with his prayers of intercession. And I'm so thankful that when I forget to pray, he does not forget to pray for me. He gets ahead of it. You see, he knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything we're going to do from day to day. He knows our failures. He knows our faults. And he gets ahead of it with his prayers. So there's never an unanswered problem. He's always praying for it, even if we don't. Hebrews 8, 1 says, Now this is the things we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such a high priest. Now that's a blank statement. We have such a high priest. 
Just like Aaron was a great high priest to God, we have such a high priest, Jesus Christ, our high priest. One time, I was preaching a sermon over the radio, and I preached that the Catholic Church needs a high priest. And uh, this Catholic priest wrote me a letter, and he said, Jack, you need a priest. You don't have a priest. And in my next sermon, I said to the gentleman who didn't sign his name, Yes, I do have a priest. His name is Jesus Christ. He is my high priest. I have a priest. And that's what this says in Hebrews 8.1. We have such a high priest. Is he your priest this morning? Is he your Savior, your Redeemer this morning? If He is, you have a high priest. And He prays continually for you. For your failures, for your faults, for your needs. The priest at the golden altar could do nothing for the sinner until he had come by the brazen altar. Until we come to God by the way of the cross, believing that Christ died for our sins, we're not ready for the golden altar of incense. The golden golden altar of incense speaks of prayer. And the unsaved cannot pray. God does not hear the prayers of the unsaved. But He hears the prayers of those that are His. Those that have come to Him by the way of the cross. There's an old hymn. I must needs go by the way of the cross. The way of the cross. If the way of the cross I miss... I'll ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. So you see, the high priest had to come by the brazen altar, the cross. Then he comes in to the golden altar of incense. And so it is with us. We come to God by the way of the cross, believing Christ died on the cross for our sins. And then we go to prayer. We pray. We pray because we've been to the, to the brazen altar. And we go to the altar of incense and we pray. And our high priest prays for us. Remember the dying thief? The dying thief said to Jesus, Come down from this cross and save thyself and us. If Jesus had come down from the cross, He could not have saved us. And this dying thief wanted Jesus to come down from the cross and to bypass the death of the cross. But had Jesus bypassed the death on the cross, there would be no salvation for us. Now the third thing we need to consider, not only the high priest and the altar, but consider the prayer of the high priest. What does he pray for? Well, I'll start with the reverse order. What does he not pray for? He is praying for somebody. Who does he not pray for? Aaron the high priest did not pray for the other nations. When he made a sacrifice on the brazen altar, it was only for Israel. It was not for the Perizzites or the Judasites or the Hittites or the Philistines. He offered no prayer for them. He made no atonement for them. He had no work of the cross for them. They were left out. But he made intercession and a sacrifice for Israel and Israel alone. And in the New Testament age in which we live, he makes intercession for us. But he does not pray for the lost unless there is a man. Then he does. Aaron the high priest wore a breastplate. And the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were on this breastplate. And when he went into the high, when he went in as high priest into the holy place to intercede to God for Israel, he wore their names on his breast. The tribe of Dan, the tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Issachar. The tribe of Levi. 
their names were on his breastplate. And he carried that breastplate on his chest in before God. And your name and my name is on the breastplate of Christ. And he appears before the Father and he makes intercession for us. Who does he pray for? Not the unsaved. Unless they're one of his elect that's not yet been gathered in. But he does not pray for the unsaved. And the unsaved, he does not answer their prayers. Secondly, he does not pray for those who worship other gods. Psalm 16, 4. Their sorrow shall be multiplied that hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of blood I will not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. God says those that worship false gods I will not pray for. I will not take their name to my lips. Jesus did not pray for everyone. Would you listen to his great high priestly prayer in John 17? Jesus, just before he was arrested and crucified, prayed to the Father. And this is what he said in John 17, 9. He's praying for the disciples, his apostles. And he said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Let me repeat that. I pray not for the world. Jesus is not praying for world evangelism. He is not praying for the world. He's praying for those who are His. Which Thou hast given me, for they are Thine. Father, You have a people. Some of them haven't been saved yet. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for this unsaved world. I'm not praying for those that worship false gods. I'm praying for your people that you belong, that belong to you, that you plan to save. I pray for them also, but I pray not for the world. Praise for his own. What does he pray for? I'll give you a few things. He prays for the conversion of those that will be in the future redeemed. You see, God has some people in the world tonight, today, that are not saved. But Jesus died for them on the cross. And God's great love sent Jesus to die for their sins. And they're going to hear the gospel and they're going to believe on Jesus Christ and they're going to become Christians. And so he prays for them. He said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. The word that we preach in the church and around the world. Some are going to be saved. And he's praying for those people that are going to become Christians. And he prays for the believer's strength. He knows we're weak. He knows we're not strong. He knows the world is arrayed against us. And he prays for the strength of his people. Then he prays, fourthly, that they would persevere and continue in the faith. So many make a good start and then fall by the wayside. I've had people walk down the aisle, shake my hand and say, I'm trusting Christ this morning. And six months later, you couldn't find them anywhere. Don't go to church anywhere, don't believe anything. They made a good start, but they, they fell off. They were never saved to begin with. So he prays for our perseverance that we'll continue on to the last day trusting in Him, looking to Him, because He knows that we have to persevere to the end. And He gives us grace through His intercession to persevere to the end. You see, if Jesus didn't keep me, I wouldn't be kept today. He has to keep me. I cannot keep myself. I cannot save myself. He has to save me, and He did. And He has to keep me, and He does. 
He saves me and He keeps me. That's a wonderful salvation. To know that the one who saved you will also keep you. He won't let you fall away. He'll keep you. You may fall away for a while, but if you do, you'll come back. If you're truly one of His, you'll come back to Him. You'll persevere. Then He prays for their glorification. What does that mean? He prays for that new body. Someday their bodies are going to be laid out in a grave and buried. Their souls are going up into heaven. But He prays for their resurrection from the grave. Their bodies be raised from the grave. Their souls reunite with their bodies. And they live in these bodies again. If I died today, they would lay my body in a grave. But I wouldn't be in that grave. I'd be on high with my Savior. I'd be up there, not down there. And on the morning of the resurrection, when He returns to the heavens, there's a shout. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet them in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. He'll raise the dead. Unite their souls with their bodies. And they'll live again as they live now. Only with new bodies. Bodies that will never be sick. Bodies that will never know pain. Bodies that will be strong and young and healthy. And never die again. That's the resurrection. So he prays for their glorification. For their resurrected bodies. And then again, he prays for dangers that they are unaware of. There are dangers around us that we're not even aware of. And He prays for us because He sees those dangers and He intervenes so those dangers don't overcome us. What would we do without our intercessor priest? What would we do without Jesus looking after us? And then He prays for the dangers that are unaware of and protection from the enemies that we're not conscious of. You know, you may have an enemy today that you're not even aware of. Planning to do you harm. But Jesus sees him. And Jesus stands between you and him. And he prays for you. And you'll be alright. He prays in a ministry of loving care for his people. He's concerned about everything in their lives. And not only that. He helps them with their difficulties. He helps them in their trials and in their testings. And when the world is about to overcome them, He steps in and gives them strength and courage and encouragement and lets them know that He's with them. Hebrews 2.18 says, For in that He Himself has suffered, being tested, He is able to succor them which are tested. When you go through a testing, He wants you to know that He's been there before you. He's been tested every conceivable way that a person could be tested. He was tested with poverty. He was tested with traitors. Tested with false friends. He was tested by misrepresentation. He was tested by things that He didn't do or say. He's been through every testing that you can ever go through. And He's able to succor you in those testings that you go through because He's been there. I have several illustrations pressing in on my mind. I'll have to leave them for another time. The high priest of Israel entered the most holy place to place the blood on the mercy seat, on the horns of the tabernacle. Likewise, Jesus entered heaven, placed His blood on the mercy seat, that there the Father could look on the blood and see that we've been redeemed with the blood of Christ. Do you remember that early morning, which some people called Easter? Jesus had just risen from the dead, and Mary goes to the garden tomb, she wants to anoint his body for burial. She's unaware that he's risen from the grave. And suddenly she sees the figure of a man standing before her. And she says, Sir, if you're the gardener and you've taken him away, tell me where you've laid him. 
And that man spoke one word, Mary. Instantly she knew that voice. She cried, Rabboni, Master, you're alive. And he said, go back and tell the disciples. I will appear to them in the upper room. But he said something else to her. He said, touch me not. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. Touch me not. Now the high priest, when he went into the tabernacle to place an offering or to intercede, no one could touch the high priest. You couldn't touch him. You couldn't go near him. Because it would defile the high priest. So no one was to touch the high priest before he entered the holy place where God would meet with him. And what does Jesus say to Mary? Touch me not. I've not yet ascended to my Father. And that same evening, that same evening, He had ascended to heaven, placed His blood on the mercy seat, and came back down, and He appeared in the upper room to His disciples, and He said, Touch me, feel of me, handle me, and see that a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. I'm not a spirit. I'm Jesus. I'm alive. Feel of my hands. He said to Thomas, put your finger in the print of my hands. Thrust your hand into my side where the Roman spear went in. And be not faithless but believing. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he didn't need to do that. He believed. Why did he say to them, now you can touch me? When eight hours ago, he said, touch me not. Because he had already put the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. And he has come back down now to meet with his disciples and they can touch him now. Because the blood has been placed on the mercy seat in heaven. The blood that redeems and saves so Hebrews 7.24 says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. For us. For you and me who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, He appears before the Father for us. Not for the world, but for us. Us as the believers. Those who trust Him. Then in verse 24, But this man, because he had continued forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he was able also to save them to the uttermost, seeing that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, made higher than the heavens. He's our priest. Then the Holy Spirit on earth is our priest also. Not our high priest, but He is our indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans 8, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You see, we have two intercessors. We have the Holy Spirit as an intercessor in us, and we have Jesus as our high priest intercessor for us at the right hand of God. Consider the punishment for those who would defile the golden altar of incense. Exodus 30 and verse 9. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt offering, nor meal offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. Now, to offer strange incense upon the altar was to defy God. It was to offer something God had not commanded. 
It was a mixture of things that God did not require, nor did He request it, and He abhorred it. It was only to be offered by the frankincense and the incense that God laid out to Aaron. Now, there were two men, Nadab and Abihu, and they were the sons of Aaron the high priest. They were also priests, and they ministered in the same tabernacle, but they were rebellious. They were reprobates. They were not saved. And what they did is they took and put strange fire upon that altar. See, the fire on that altar had to be carried from the brazen altar, the cross. And they took away the fire from the brazen altar and did not put it upon the golden altar. They left the cross out and God slew Nadab and Abihu for offering strange fire upon the altar. Let me read it. For Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire thereon and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now these two men defied God. They said, we don't need that cross. We don't need that brazen altar. We will just offer on the incense. We will just offer the prayers. Prayers on the altar of incense, which pictures prayer. We'll offer that. We don't need that brazen altar. We don't need that cross. And there are preachers today that are committing the sin of Nadab and Abihu. They're offering strange fire instead of the sweet gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're offering strange fire. They're telling us today that our God is not omniscient. They're saying that He does not know everything. They're saying that He has to learn. But my friends, that's not the God the Bible portrays. That's not the God of heaven. The God of creation knows everything. He knows every thought in your mind. He knows everything you'll do tomorrow before you do it. He is omniscient and omnipresent. And this strange fire that men are preaching today leaves out the goat, leaves out the brazen altar, leaves out the cross, leaves out the blood atonement. Leaves out genuine salvation by grace through faith. They are offering strange fire. And you can go to church after church after church after church today and you'll hear the Nadabs and the Bayous offering strange fire unto God that He hates. He hates any gospel message that leaves the cross out. Why do they do that? I'll tell you why they do it. I've got books in my library showing where they deceitfully gloss over the cross. Leave the cross out. My friend, no man will ever enter heaven unless he goes by the way of the cross. And they're leaving the cross out. Anything. And they're silent. He said, which of you convinceth me of sin? And nobody made a charge against Jesus. They were silent. We stand in the same position before God because Jesus has adjudicated our case. We stand free, not guilty. We're acquitted. We walk out of the courtroom free, no charge made against us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor mysteries can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nobody can take me away from Jesus. Nobody can separate me from Jesus. 
I'm His and His forever. Not only does He save us, but He keeps us. That's a salvation and a Savior worth having. I trust today that you believe the old-time religion, the old-time gospel that the moderns scoff at today. Cling to the old rugged cross. It'll lead you home. I read one time of a man visiting a friend and suddenly it grew very dark and he said, oh, I've overstayed my stay and it's dark and I can't make my way through the forest home. What will I do? And his friend said, just a minute. He went over to the wood pile and he got a pine torch, put it in the fire. He set that pine torch on fire, put it in his friend's hand and said, here, take this. It'll see you home. I'll tell you today, the old gospel of Jesus Christ will see you home. He'll see you home through the dark night of this world. He'll see you home. Let's stand together and be dismissed. Please in prayer. As we pray this morning, Brother Kitchens, would you?